uh, thank you so much for joining us for our February Black Love event. Um, this one was special to me, as you know, because it's my work. And so glad you had a chance to tune in to watch it. And as usual, we have a post discussion. And so I wanted to bring in um, a really good friend of mine who we go back, 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 back in the day, way back. I want to say, I want to say elementary school, right? Okay. Elementary school, junior high school, high school. And then we were both yearbook editors for Sam Houston High School. And so I used to always um, have DL edit my work because I can't spell worth a damn. And he was always so patient with me. <laughs> but I want to introduce uh, Tilford DL Grant. We call him DL. And um, I'm going I'm to let you take over. I'm going to switch the rings and become the interviewee now, DL. But thank you. DL is the uh, branch manager at the Carver Library in San Antonio, where I'm going to, I'm there actually live now after the film but we have to do a virtual as well so we wanted to include this pre-recording and present it to you all uh, with questions and answers thanks to you i'm gonna turn it over to you <laughs> well i'm really glad to have the opportunity to do this uh the film is powerful it means so much to us it meant so much to the community it was a labor of love for you and when we got to premiere it, what was that, 2014? I had just taken over as manager at the Carver Branch in San Antonio, and everybody showed up for that event. And we did it a couple. We did it a couple of times. I mean, it, 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 strong responses because yeah. people could really relate to that. One thing I really remember people saying was, well, "It could have been anybody's family." Um, your grandmother, Susanna, could really have been anybody's grandmother, the way she related to the, oh, you guys, the love um, for her family, the sacrifices she made, they could have been anybody's family. So I'm just delighted to be here uh, to talk about this film and, and uh, yeah, talk about this film, great film. Thank you. You won an award for it, uh, I remember too. Yeah, so it's an award winning film. This one, um, this one, I didn't, I, I didn't really do the festival route, so this wasn't a big festival award one. Middle Passage was the one I won. Middle, Middle Passage, yeah. that was the one this, I love. Yeah, this one, I, I didn't really do the whole film festival route. Um, I just, I did a couple of film festivals, and then I just show it, show it, and you know, people can bring me in for speaking engagements, and I talk about the film. But I didn't do the big festival route for this. This was more. We seen that one too. That, that was amazing. <laughs> Mm. So, so much fun. fun. Again, you do your work is always relatable to the culture. I think it's great. Thank you. Yeah, this this film, I mean, um, I mean it you know, for me it's like priceless. Because when you document somebody, when you die, it can be your grandparents, your teacher, your you know, your pastor, anybody, your, your yeah, grandmother. But and when grandparents. you when you document somebody, you can bring them up into existence at any point in time that you want. When you when you miss someone, when your birthday celebrations, because they're documented, like you know, and it's like so many people pass on. It's like they say when it, like when an, an elder passes, you know, it's like a library burning. That's how much knowledge and wisdom that goes away. That's a very we don't have it anymore. Proverbs. Proverbs. So for me, true. this is so priceless because it, the, their presence is omni. It's, they're omnipresent in my life because I can turn. I can turn them on any time. And that that moment, those those moments of actually being there in nineteen. I want to say 87, 86, Um, it comes back. It comes back to me sitting at that dining room table and having, you know, Thanksgiving dinner or whatever dinner that was. Um, I was fortunate enough to have a friend when I this this I did this when I just graduated from Howard in nineteen eight graduated in eighty six from Howard University, and one of my friends, uh, you know, before he went off to work for CNN, Shawande Tachawa, I was like, hey, can you come with me just on a weekend, you know? And he came, I, I paid for his trip to come to Louisiana just to document us, because he was a camera guy back in the day, videographer. And um, he did, he just you know, went into action and just, just documented everyday activities and what we were doing. And um, 
it, I just I'm forever indebted to to Shawande for that for for capturing this part of our 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 family's history and life and so yeah I'm in I'm in awe of that but prior to even doing the actual documenting that he did and this was in three quarter inch tape that's how long ago that was that's the big broadcast tapes like this thick. And you know, they'd go into a big three quarter inch machine. So this was captured on three quarter inch tape. And it was like DC TV back in the day. I think we, we used their, their cameras and stuff and took and, um, you know, did the documentary. But that's how long ago this was. But because of technology, I was able to transfer it over to 1080, you know, digital formats. And we were able to bring it back to life just by having it transferred, but the initial thing was documenting it, period, you know. I remember that old technology. I was a broadcasting student myself. And um, I'm so glad that you did this. I mean, so many of us wish we had captured our grandparents in, 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 in the format that you did. We have photographs, but you have captured the voice uh, of Mama Frank's uh, Savannah will live on through your work. I mean, mm -hmm. I wish we had, the rest of us had had, well, I know we all wish we'd have the presence of mind to do that. With, but um, cell phones are so prevalent, you can act, you can do that now easily. But back then, it took special effort. And at that point, everybody didn't even have video cameras. Um, but, so that would come first. But you know what, DL, you know what? I, I used to actually, every time I'd go visit my grandmother, I think when I, I think high school and beyond, I used to take a little, cassette recorder so i you know to me to me the thing is documenting and so if you don't have the video with it now you're right cell phones i encourage everyone especially young folks who just got that cell phone talk to your parents talk to your mom talk to your dad talk to your grandparents and videotape them with that video on the phone um but back then i started the process by just cassette tapes and then i had this little uh, cheap ass uh camcorder that uh, so I had got, and then I I would do it on the VHS camcorders, and so by the time I I was familiarized with what she would say, and I familiarized with the stories whenever. So by the time I got to college and was able to do this documenting, I knew what to ask her, what to trigger, what would come out because we had she repeated herself from the recordings that I had previously done. So I knew what I wanted to get out of her on a lot of occasions, especially when she, she's telling the story about Buki and Lepin. Buki and Le Pen, the the rabbit, and 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 that story. There was this African brother. That story resonated for him because he was from Senegal and he knew the story of Buki and Le Pen from Senegal. I mean, and that and that's just like wow. It's amazing how as I started showing this film, how it connect to people in different ways that I would have never imagined. So it's amazing. And so you 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 think about love the, 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 uh, that came out it, that just uh, oozes throughout this whole thing, and that's what what we're celebrating uh, love and, and, and black love and our families. It's, it's it's just such a beautiful thing. It was it, it was a, it was really a gift to all of us, really, when you did because we saw ourselves in your family, and we're so glad that we did that. And I think. Even other, other groups other and other cultures, cultures that will be able to see this, I think they will see that as well. They do. Uh, people, at the end of the day, we're all kind of alike. We all want the same things. Universal. We all we love is such a huge part of everybody, what we want, what we do. So for me, it's the love and it's also the memory. And and just having the, the good memories that my parents were able to instill in us, let us experience, but to, to have our memories and then to get the memories that were passed down by my mother and my grandmother. Um, my father's side, unfortunately, a lot of love and memories from elders, but my grandparents were both deceased before I even existed. So I missed, I really wish I could have gotten a chance to see Julia and tell us about Babano on, on my dad's side. But one thing that I really appreciate that my dad did when he was living when we were little, Whenever we would go to Louisiana, he would take us around to visit the old people, the elders. This is my uncle. This is my uncle's uncle. This is, you know, this is. And so, you know, he had relatives that didn't even speak English because they were, you know, were speaking French and Patois. I mean, and, um, you know, Creole, they were, they were speaking the language. 
And so there were some elders that were really up in, you know, their hundreds or nineties that they didn't even speak English. But for him to have that pride and that love from his family to take us around to introduce us was really monumental to the development of my life and how I wanted to raise my daughter to have that love and appreciation for family. And that is being so lost now because there's such a, there's such a disconnect in first cousins and cousins be, and and knowing your uncles and your aunts and and visiting the elders and uh, it's just it's just disheartening for me that there's such that that disconnect and what we experienced growing up the way our parents connected us to the elders was just it it, it lives inside of you you know um, I, I have some of the same memories going to my mom's hometown. And before we would leave, Daddy would load up the car, and then we we would do the same thing. We go by Aunt Honey and Uncle Ben, and then we go see this one and that one. And you know, I didn't know what was going on. I mean, I know I knew we were connecting with elders, but I didn't grasp it the way I am now, and the way you grasp it now. What he was doing was creating a uh, connection. Uh, the family. And I'm so glad we did those things. My memory is very hazy. What do you remember about your grandparents? Well, you know, the, the, the part I talk about where we just load the, load the station wagon <laughs> and drive from San Antonio to, to Opelousas, Louisiana, just that drive in itself <laughs> is so full of memories. And, and, and it was like getting in the car, piling five kids in the car in, a, in addition to food and clothes and everything that you can imagine. We had to stop in Houston first, visit my Aunt Maydale and her kids and Aunt Lois. And we and we dropped off food along the way because my dad was all about giving. He was such a provider and a giver that he would always provide for his sisters. Even when he was young and went, went away to the army, he would send back money from home. So he was always that. So that, that drive was so special. Mom would make fried chicken and white bread and put that in a tin, and we'd have that along the way. Uh, we'd have cookies and chips and, cry, and and just eat along the way in that drive and sleep in the station wagon with the covers and and count the, we'd make up little games as we were kids, like count the horns, you know, the make the, we'd try to make the big truck drivers blow the horns as we're driving and count the color cars and all kinds of stuff. Just that drive was just so you know, memorable. And then once we once we got to the Opelousas and crossed those railroad tracks, you know how you got to cross the tracks to get to the black side of town? You, <laughs> you cross the tracks and, and just to turn that corner and the horn beep in, my grandmother waiting up by the window. I mean, those things are just embedded in your mind and your heart, um, the, the the memories of that. And then she'd always have something cooked. Do you see what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> it's Everything. like it all comes back to you. We all have some cook. We we had to, we had to lay on the mattress on the floor and sleep. I mean, it was just so much, and it was you so describe everybody's, everybody's childhood. <laughs> this is going to come through, and we, yeah. you know, the, the way we travel. See, now those are stories right there because we weren't that far removed from Green Book. Uh, yeah. We used the Green Book, and so your parents knew how to prepare well. We weren't going to stop. stop. We didn't know how we were going to be received. I mean, you know, it, it, this was an adventure. And yeah. it sounds very exciting. I remember my grandmother doing the same thing, fitting out, waiting out. And then food, how they showed love. <sighs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, you know, it's, 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 I cannot see Luana products without thinking about your grandpa, Papa Flames. But you, and, and you know what? Luana Foods, <laughs> my grandparents live down the down the down the track i mean luana foods is right there the property is still there but but um that that place we we got the chance my sister karen and i my daughter savannah one summer when i was making this documentary we got the chance to actually go visit luana foods and the lady was so sweet she took us inside and took us around let folks know this is nate frank's grandchildren and so they named a dinner, it says in the film, after Nathan Frank, because he was the, one of the hardest working. He worked there until he was like 80 something, 60, 60 something years. He worked at Luana Foods since he was since he was 20 something all the way to, to 80. And so they they named a dinner him. So when we went, they took us around, introduced us to people. 
people were like, oh, yeah, because they, you know, that's a big thing now. His uh, annual gumbo dinner, Nathan Frank gumbo dinner is an annual thing at Luann Foods. And so it was it was an honor. People were talking about memories. They were there were some elders still there talking about memories of Papa Frank. And um, it was just it was just sweet. It was sweet because I mean he cherished his job, child, cherished his job. But then but then the, the part of the farming was also yes. awesome. They had this huge garden and chicken the yard. <laughs> and that and that yeah and I grew up on a farm our chicken yard everything because my parents kept that going um but but going there and just being a part of that that um that family love and and you know the cooking the it's just yeah it's just something that just can't go away and it's just like you know I wish my kids could experience my kid could experience that um, that part of Louisiana. Well, you did it. You did your best. I mean, you I have a bounce, Savannah yeah. <laughs> for oh. her, her, her great grandma. Yeah, I named my daughter um, Savannah. Savannah is 26 now, and she did get a chance to go to Papa Frank's house when he was alive. He, there's even a picture of him holding her. So she was eight months, and um, her her cousins were like one year and two years when he was alive, and then he passed. But she did she actually experience being in the house <laughs> and, um, you know, having the, the video play also is amazing. But, yeah, I, I, I've always loved the name Savannah. And when I had a when I was when I was pregnant, I didn't even have a boy's name picked out. It was going to be a girl and it was going to be she was going to be named Savannah, period. So that's just the way the Lord made it work out for me. But she is so much like her grandmother, just such a hard worker honest um don't take no shit from nobody i mean she is that kind of kind of little woman and i just love her and respect her so much and as i did her her grandmother so well, to, that to makes me to... proud when you name somebody after somebody that person needs to reflect or have some some semblance of what that person embodied um should at least because that you name them you know for that reason, you want them. You want them to have something qualities of that person, typically. But well, yeah. talk, about, talk a little talk bit more about, about legacy and what it means to to you and and share with our audience what you believe it means to African American families as we express love. Oh God, I mean, what you leave behind is so important. Like, it's like it's like my grandparents were were so well respected. They were so well respected. So when you mention their name to certain people, that respect is there. And so the, the legacy that they left also in terms of teaching traditions, you know, things that my mom have taught taught us and instilled in us came from came from them. You know, the the, the hard work ethic, you know, the being respected, being responsible. I mean, my mom didn't raise no wimps. She raised women and a man. You know, she she didn't raise bullshit people. My you know, my sisters and brothers are women and men. And you know, you you hope that that continues with them, but there's so much that is lost in the sauce with with brothers and sisters and and the dynamic of the world and how we, we the, everything plays in. You know, we used to go to church on Sunday. There's things with the family that school and soccer came in the way of church and so that church thing is totally out the way um you know with, with rearing the kids for my sister and brother's era so things that things that were there traditionally be, be you know we, we worked every day we went to school we went we went away to college so there's no more driving yes, yes. to louisiana or driving to texas it's having to get on a plane and fly and so there wasn't a traditional every summer the kids come into grandma's house. There, there's not, you know, it's like if you can afford to fly your family, you come. You know, if you can afford to do this, you come. So the, the, the traditional stuff of us, the way we were reared with going every summer, spending time on the farm with your grandparents, getting to know who they are, being in their company, being embraced by elders in the community, that's missing. That's gone from my my sisters and brothers' generation of kids. They missed that, you know. Well, I know um, you're doing your best. I mean, look at the, look at this, this work that you have uh, you've given us. How are I, mean, I know how I 
my impression of the audience is because I've seen this has been explained before my eyes. How do you feel the audiences have been uh, receiving this documentary? I think audiences relate to it, like you said, and I've showed it in mixed audiences with white people and black people. It's just, it's just, you know, it, it is a universal story of people relating to their elders and what their elders mean to them in their lives and what they've instilled and done for them. And so I, you know, it was just, it was so funny. One, one elder white woman I showed in New Jersey and she, she commented to me on the tablecloth in the dining room how she remembers that her mother had a tablecloth like that. So it's like the littlest things that you're, you're shocked that people are picking up on that are like, huh? It triggered an emotion. It triggered an emotion because of the setting and the time and what she had as an elder in her, in her possession. And so little things like that are nice. Like I said, the African brother who picked up Buki and Le Pen, I mean, people that are talking about their memories of driving to their grandparents' house. So there is that universality of uh, quality in the film that, that's very, um, very essential, very key, that, um, that makes it nice. I mean, it was, for me, a, a, one of the surprises was, okay, this film I did in 86, put on three quarter inch and just put it in a case, put it under the bed. So I would say from 86 to... By the time I went back to grad school in 210, that's how long that this, this has sat. 210. And then, I, so I went to grad school at AU and I was like, I'm going to pull this out and let this be my thesis film. That was my thing going to grad school, learning how to physically edit because I always had to get American University. Hmm? American, American University. University. Yeah, thesis. I went there for grad school. Howard undergrad, American grad. But... I, I went there with the with the with the mentality, the vision that this was going to be my my thesis film. Once I know how to edit in grad school, I'll do it myself. And so I was able to do that and put it in you know format whatever. And then I um I think I got one grant to kind of get it going. Did a fundraiser, which I was shocked that people put money in towards helping me finish my grandmother's film. But it was wonderful. I read, I did a GoFundMe, got funded to get bring an editor on. Um, Alan Johnson did the music. Awesome musician out of uh, D.C. Did the music. Um, I had you know an editor come on, help me finish, and it, it was able to happen. And then we premiered it. Had a wonderful opening. You know the opening premiere of it in D.C. and premiered it in Opelousas, where I brought my mother with me to Opelousas at the Delta Theater where she used to work when she was a child, I mean, a teenager at the Delta Theater in Opelousas, where it was for colors only on this side. And yeah, that, the history of the theater. So be able to to, to show it there. Uh, Curly Taylor was uh, allowed me to use his Zydeco music in the film and everything. I guess when it's time, it, it just comes together and, um, you know, it's it's a it's an amazing experience for to be a part of it coming well, together. You make me wonder, what do you want others to get from you documenting your family history? What do you mean? I think I, I, I think that might be kind of clear, but what would you? Because it, it makes us want to go out and use whatever technology, whatever means we can. But what would you say? Well, that's the thing. I want people to document. Because everybody's life is valid, has validity. Everybody's story is important. If not to anybody else, then to yourself and to the generations that represent you, you know, down the line may not even be born yet. To have this 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 doc this piece of family history documented, it's like a it's like kind of like a roadmap to show what, what came before you and who came before you. You know? So I want people to walk away with the um, inspiration to do their own documentary, documenting of their grandparents and their parents and their aunts and their aunties, different events in their lives that are important. Put it on tape. You, it, there's no excuse now. We all, everybody has a smartphone, it seems, you know? You can add to a smartphone, put it on a simple editing program and edit it. Or, you know, whenever you're available to. But the, the main thing is to capture life that you witness, you know, and save it and and pass it on to to um, the next generation. You know how important it is to hear voices. I, mean, I was listening to NPR the other day. 
and it was Langston Hughes' birthday, and they had a re audio, rare audio recording of Langston Hughes that they found. I had never heard Langston Hughes' voice. I had just read his awesome works. I don't think I've ever heard his So myself. to hear his voice reading his poetry, oh my God. You know, I mean, for me, it, 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 to bring life to pictures that are hanging on the wall, you know, that hearing your grandmother talk, your grandfather talk, I mean, that is just, you can't, you can't beat it. You can't beat it. You yeah, talked about, one time you, you gave a presentation at the library and it helped us to appreciate how to capture moments in ways we didn't consider. Like, cap, like okay, a lot of our elders will leave recipes behind. You helped me to appreciate the fact that, you know, how cool to capture them making that dish who, that, 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 whose recipe uh, uh, that goes on. Uh, uh, survives on uh, as a legacy. I remember in the film, something else. I think it was your sister, your older sister, Lisa, who attended mm -hmm. school with my sister. And, and Lisa goes, Next to the oldest. I mean, third to the oldest. She's not the oldest. Mm -hmm. You remember that? Yeah. <sighs> beans and rice. So you yes. Beans like yes. 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 <laughs> but you know, you know what? I, I have the awesome uh, pleasure at this time in my life. To the, you know, to, my birthday is was yesterday because we're showing the film day after my birthday. That's but right. at this time in my life, you know, as I'm moving up the ladder, <laughs> up the stairs, I have the pleasure to be here, to be omnipresent with my mother. My mother turned 88 January 30, 30th. 88. So she's, she's, uh, she's surpassed her father and her mother's life. And to be here at a juncture in my life where I'm with her every day, you know, I'm eating her food, hearing her talk, hearing her stories, um, is, is like I said, it's, it's priceless. It, I am so fortunate. And um, we, I had a, you know, I was so glad the family, that's talking about family love in the midst of, of, in the midst of whatever, our family love. I had the idea of, for her birthday, she loves flowers and plants and gardening. She's still very active at 88 with all the aches and the pains and the, you know, uh, she's still very active planting her garden, her flowers. So she has a flower bed for her father, I mean, for her, my dad. They call each other mama and daddy because we were kids, we call them mom and daddy. So they call each other mom and daddy. So she has a flower bed that she dedicated to him because my dad's been uh, deceased, oof, oh my God, since early 2000s. And so she guys come and say, yeah, I want to do this flower bed for daddy. I want to do this flower bed for daddy. So I had this, I woke up one morning. I'm like, what would make her happy on her 88th birthday? Dad's flower bed. <laughs> so I, I, I text all my brothers and we have a group chat. I text everybody, told them what I, my idea, told them how this would make her happy and what I wanted to do. If we get a landscaper to come in and do daddy's garden. She wanted to, she wanted to dedicate to him. There's a plow there, a, a, a plant, flower, flags, or she wanted all that stuff. And so a landscaper came in, Sylvester Landscaping came in and mom was in the back the whole time. She didn't even know they were here because the thing's in the front. So they were able to do, to revamp, remake that entire flower bed, daddy's flower bed, Romel's garden for her. And on her 88th birthday, I had a Zoom call schedule. Everybody was on the Zoom. We presented her with the guard, brought her out. And she was speechless. She was near tears. She, she was so, so that was just such a wonderful thing for the family to join together in love um, and support of their grandmother and make this 88th birthday so special for her. So, yeah, that was one of the things that was just like, ah, yeah. You know, you, you keep making me think about the connections to my own family. You're going to continue to get that. Uh, and I hope you continue to show this film and to more and more audiences. It's available for them. I just think about the fact that my great grandmother, Fanny Taylor, was around her grandmother, who had been a slave. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, if only the technology had existed, we would have learned so much more about Grandma Harriet's life, uh, who had been this enslaved person in DeWitt County. You really don't want to lose an opportunity. You, you don't, and you are not. So you're doing real work to document uh, your family to motivate the rest of us to document. Because what I'm finding out is, 
young, young people that may not have had the forethought, forethought to, to, to interview you, their elders, elders, by the time they're in the 30s and 40s, they, they wish, wish that they had. Yeah, because they'll be gone. They'll be, and it'll be too late. It'll be too late. But look what you're doing. I mean, this is, is this a clear everybody. I know we're hitting the 30 minute mark. How much time do we have left? I don't want to keep you. Hey, this is our thing. We can do our thing. <laughs> no, no, we can. We, we, you know, I think the, I think the main thing, like I said, I just, just hitting a nail over a head is to really encourage, not even just young people, elders too, document each other. You know, um, but that, that is the main thing I think I want people to get with this documentary because. Um, like I said, every there's so much that's being lost. It just in even the way kids are being reared, you know, nowadays. Um, not connecting to first cousins and aunties and uncles that are like, you know, right there. And there's you so much that. that is lost and missing. Um that it's just disheartening for me. It's just so disheartening. So I think that 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 connection staying rooted. Um, also helps people push forward. If you if you think about what your parents and grandparents and great grandparents had to go through, yes, I mean had to yeah. go through just to survive with the racism and the sexism and the the policies and laws that were even more oppressive than they're 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 now. Their brother were even more oppressive. All the things that they had to break through. That to me, knowing that and being connected to that makes me stronger. Um, and it makes me, it gives me the ability, having that ancestor's um, spirit in me keeps me going forward and you know, to want to do better, to want to do more. You um, made me think of what a great man said. Our, our dear friend, Andar Mayat, um, made a comment. He said, a lot of times when our young people, sometimes, um, acting out sometimes, sometimes they're not they're as serious about, about things as they would like for them to be a lot, a lot of times it says that happens because they don't they're, they're not aware of the greatness that they possess and that's because they can't connect to the past they don't see the shoulders that they're standing on and what a great name their family uh, really has people can't be perfect but they give you a legacy and they give you something that you can live up to so you're living up to the, the, uh, the frank's legacy the Babylon legacy we, we, our young people have such a greatness, and this is one way we could help them to see that. The dignity, the pride, you talked about the pride, the dignity. That Frank's name meant something in Southern Louisiana, in Appaloosa. I, I don't know how to say it any different way. It meant something. Yeah, yeah and, and, and to me, it starts from within. Like, once you know your history and your ancestry and all that, then you can kind of connect and kind of build your own character and be secure, hopefully, within yourself by knowing who you are. I think, you know, we, we're the first generation to get educated. But to me, education does not, does, not, um, does not give you the right to move away from your roots, from those country folk, from those, you know, it does not make you better than them that you're educated. You know what I'm saying? Some people get educated and they don't want to, they don't, they don't want to, they shy away from, from grandma's farm or, or papa's, you know, being illiterate and all that. That's part of who you are. And so um, being educated and connecting still to that country, to that root, without, you know, being too good or too dignified or sedity or whatever, it, don't, it doesn't matter the degrees of education. Yeah, I'm still mowing the grass at mama's house, you know? <laughs> I'm just like, it don't matter. I got a master's degree and I'm a filmmaker or whatever. You still do what you got to do uh, to support and uh, your, your your elders. and You know, it, it, was, a, it was a huge thing to finish the eighth grade. And, and I, don't I don't think, think my grandparents, this is one grandmother, almost finished high school. But a lot of times they didn't make it to the eighth grade. But look what they turned out. Exactly. Uh, the families, the, families the hard work, the dedication, the led. Would you coming back to led this example? That, that, that's that, so common. It's a lot of common sense, sense too. But, some of them didn't that. but they were the best scientists in their way of uh, home remedies. The way they knew how to read the earth and to tell. Uh, Agriculturists. Uh, when, like when storms would come, they, you know, you had to know how to watch the weather. That was a form of science. You, you had to know. How to get, get out, out there and, and, and get the land, land and do what you needed it to do so you could survive. 
Mm-hmm. So, so I love all of this. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would just say in this time, in this month of Black love, of love, um, love on, love on your your family, love on yourself, love on your uh, self love, family love. Those are things that keep you keep you grounded, keep you rooted, and and keep you moving moving forward. So I'm gonna leave that. Um, but this has been good. Thank you, DL. It has been a joy being able to talk to you and help other uh, other audiences to connect with a really great audience. Yeah, yeah. Thank you guys. And and I wanna encourage I wanna encourage folks to definitely please visit the Carver Community Cultural Center on um Honey Street and East Commerce. Honey, What's the address? Three three five zero East Commerce Street. That is a, a jewel on the east side, a jewel in the community. And I don't think people uh really understand how important that that building is, that the building that you that you direct and um and manage. I just, I just think people really know how important that is to have that in our community. So definitely visit. That's our hub for Save, Save If. It's in our community. We've been going, going there for years, years and now I get to work there. It's a blessing. Yes. A Dr. D.L. Tilford Grant, congratulations <laughs> again on, on getting thank you very much. through with that. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you, everybody. And we hope that you join us again next year. I mean, next month. <laughs> next month. Next month for our screening, uh, Women's History Month screening, we are going to bring the film How It Feels to Be Free. We, we Yap Films has a, allowed us to reshow that, uh, which was showed on American Masters on PBS. So that's an ideal piece for Women's History Month. So we hope you join in for that. Um, and we also want you to save the date, save the date, save the date for um Save if 2022, our theme is animation in black. So we are so excited to bring at black animators, black animations to the forefront um, and celebrating that. So Dio, thank you again. And you have a wonderful rest of your day. Take I care. am. Okay. Just got-